I am Linda Hansen, and I'm the uh, spokesperson for the League of Women Voters at Muncie, Delaware County. And I want to welcome all of you to our speaker series, our virtual speaker series. Uh, today, our subject is sex trafficking and victim advocacy in Indiana. And we've got lots of extra letters here. 2020, 2020. <laughs> um, we have some announcements that I will make at the end of the program. But at this point, I want to introduce Kim Dowling. And if I could actually share my screen. Teresa? Yep. Hold on. Sorry. Hmm. There you go. OK. And. It's not letting me there. OK, so I want to introduce only our first speaker, our one speaker, <laughs> <laughs> Judge Kim Dowling. Uh, she was elected to the bench in 2012. And you've probably had a chance to read this, but I want to remind you all. Uh, Linda, I can't hear you. Really? I can hear you OK, so I'm wondering if it's not her audio. Um, okay. I can hear can you, the rest of Judy. Okay, I'm going to go on. Um, I think it's important to know that prior to her election, uh, Judge Dowling practiced family law for 27 years. So she has a general jurisdiction court and also supervises juvenile court, the Title IV D court and the CASA program, all of which really depend upon or have grown out of that uh, experience with family law that she had for 27 years. She's a member of the Indiana Board of Juvenile and Family Court Judges and of the Indiana Supreme Court Working Group, group to address sex trafficking in the state of Indiana. And that I believe is a really crucial piece because she can carry her experience into the rest of the state. She's now been named chair of the CSEC subcommittee through the Indiana Commission on Improving the Status of Children. She's presented at national, uh, good, I don't know what, GDAI. Yeah, it's the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> uh, conference on human trafficking and has presented multiple trainings on human trafficking to the juvenile judges in Indiana. She's attended and presented at other national and state conferences. And there is more if you want to go from your link or from our website to learn more about Judge Dowling. But at this point, I would like to turn this over to her. I know we are, we're getting the words from an expert and we really appreciate you being here, Judge Dowling. Sure, glad to help. I know I was scheduled to talk to all of you before COVID hit and then right. It. And so we've all learned that we can do things by Zoom and remotely instead of having to do them in person and that keeps everyone safe. So um, I, I appreciate that. I, I do Zoom every day. Um, so just before I guess we get started into uh, trafficking, I'll tell you that for the courts, from the courts perspective, um, some courts in the state shut down, I would say back in March, but Delaware County um, has remained up and operating uh, all through that time. We've just found different ways to do that. And so um, each judge kind of handles things a little bit differently. We have started uh, having jury trials again. We started those in September. Um, we are doing only those trials that are absolutely necessary right now. And um, if our county goes red, which right now we're in Orange County, um, but if we go red, then we will shut trials down completely again until uh, that color goes back to an orange color. So um, I can, we can talk a little bit more about that at the end if anybody has questions about that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so um, you can 
you see here that I teach a lot with a woman named Tracy McDaniel. And um, when I present statewide, um, I, Tracy and I travel together and we've gone to numerous counties in the state. I should have started keeping track at the beginning, but had no idea it would turn into what it's turned into. So Tracy and I have traveled the state. We've trained counties, um, their juvenile justice folks, so probation, law enforcement, uh, the judges, their magistrates, uh, DCS, so Department of Child Services, CASA, anyone in their county who touches uh, the juvenile justice system and uh, have trained um, a couple of counties more than once just because of the turnover that we have. So I'm gonna talk today a little bit about um, you know, what we've been dealing with, a little bit about legislation, a little bit about what those red flags are and just kind of what it looks like uh, for us in the system. And, and I'm happy to take questions. And if you wanna wait until the end for questions, that's fine. If you have a question as I'm going, please don't hesitate to unmute yourself and let me know you have a question. I'll be happy to take those as we go. So when we talk about human trafficking, there are two types of human trafficking. One is sex trafficking and one is labor trafficking. When I teach and what I deal with mostly throughout the state is the sex trafficking component, um, but there is labor trafficking too. And, and a lot of what I talk about and teach about applies to both. Uh, the statutes um, have been separated out. I can talk a little bit about that um, when I talk about legislation. So sex trafficking is when a commercial sex act is induced. Now this wording, there's a difference here. So let me say that if it's force, fraud, or coercion, that applies to an adult. But force, fraud, and coercion are not required for the prosecutor to prove if a juvenile is involved. And so we use the adult language here, but I want you to remember that that's not necessarily true for juveniles. So when a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or where the person induced to perform that act has not yet reached the age of 18. Labor trafficking is just what it sounds like. So somebody's recruited, um, kept, they're transported, um, they're obtained for their, their labor or services. And again, if it's an adult, it's through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. But again, if it's a juvenile, those things aren't required. And that's usually to pay off a debt. So, you know, you've heard stories where people are brought over from other countries um, to pay off debt, but it's not necessarily that somebody from another country is here. A lot of times it's US citizens, and I'll talk a little bit more about that too. So what does it really mean? It means that someone is using force, fraud, or coercion if it's an adult, that's not required for the juvenile, against another person to cause them to work or engage in commercial sex or labor if it's labor trafficking. Usually then what I'm talking about when I teach is juveniles, but remember that it also applies to adults. So Indiana Code 3542 3.5 1.1 is the newest version of um, the labor trafficking statute. I think, let me, let me go back. Nope, sorry. 1.1 is the sex trafficking statute. 3.5-1 is the labor trafficking statute. They used to just all be one statute all lumped together. And two years ago, the legislature worked to expand trafficking and separate them all out. So a person who knowingly or intentionally, this is the adult statute, uses force, threat of force, coercion, or fraud to recruit, entice, harbor, or transport an individual with the intent of causing them to marry another person, engage in prostitution, or participate in sexual conduct, commits promotion of human sex trafficking, a level four felony. Now, the 1.2 statute, I believe it is, is the juvenile sex trafficking statute. And so the force, threat of force, coercion language is taken out. And then instead of it being a level four felony, it raises to a level three felony. We have basically seven levels of felonies in Indiana. We start with murder, it's its own. And then we have levels one through six with six being the lowest. So four is right there in the middle. Three is gonna be one step above that. So one is kind of that highest level felony just below murder. And then six is the lowest. 
So um, prosecutors do not have to prove force if we're talking about a minor, and that then becomes the level three felony. Any individual can be guilty of committing trafficking of a child. There's no specific relationship required, but we see it in many different forms. So the most typical thing you would think of um, would be a trafficker, a pimp, um, a perpetrator who is selling children. But sometimes it's family members of theirs. So sometimes it's their own parents. Sometimes it's a foster parent. Sometimes it's an aunt or uncle. Sometimes it's a cousin. So maybe another juvenile. Um, but, but sometimes it's also their, the child may be uh, gotten involved in either a gang or it's gangs who are then trafficking and who are sucking these kids into the sex trafficking industry. Restitution is available to trafficking victims and they may also have a civil cause of action to recover other damages from their trafficker. It's tied as the second largest and fastest growing criminal industry in the world just behind the drug trade. Um, it's $150 billion a year industry. And when I'm, when I'm teaching in person, um, I try to ask the, the the audience that I have, why they think that is. Why do you think it's such a fast growing industry? And, and I'll just tell you the reason is because children are a reusable commodity. And that's, you know, that's a really harsh thing to have to say and think about. Um, but if you think of it in these terms, if you're talking about somebody who's in the drug industry, they're having to purchase either the drugs to turn around and resell or they're purchasing the things to make the drugs then to sell, and then they have to reinvest that money. But children, they don't purchase. They manipulate them in. I'll, we'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but they manipulate them in. And usually the only thing they're having to spend money on is either like McDonald's food, fast food, or things that um, are uh, to further entice purchasers, but it makes the child feel wanted. So getting their hair done, getting their nails done, you know, a nice pair of jeans, nice boots, that kind of thing. So, um, so they're not having to invest the kind of money they have to invest in the drug trade. And that's why it's such a fast growing industry. So 1.6 million children run away each year in, uh, in the U.S. And one in three of them will be sucked into the sex trafficking industry within 48 hours of running away from home. And when I say run away, I mean run away. They're gone for at least 24 hours. I don't mean like when I was little and my brother threw a candy bar in a paper bag because he got mad at my mom and he walked down the street, you know, but he was back in five minutes. So when I'm talking about running away, that's what I mean. They're actually runaways. And the average age into the commercial sex industry in the United States is 12 to 14. So if I'm trying to reach kids in high school, I've waited too late. I've got to get to kids in middle school. And middle schoolers are very, they're, you know, they're immature. They think they know everything. They're at that growing point where they think they know everything. They're not going to listen to somebody my age about the internet. You know, I mean, first of all, there's a lot about the internet I don't know. I'm not savvy. So to talk to kids about the internet, they're like, you know, smirking at me. Um, and so I have to get people in there who are um, knowledgeable about uh, the internet and talking with them and um, being able to further, you know, teach them about what to look out for. But um, trying to get middle schoolers to understand what they're getting into is extremely difficult. 83% of trafficking victims found in the U.S. were U.S. citizens. And that's how I'm able to explain to people this is a U.S. problem. We're not talking about kids who are being brought here from other countries, although that does happen. What we are focused on are U.S. kids being trafficked in the United States. Um, the statistic on the right-hand side of your page uh, came from Tracy and the work that she did through her agency, which was called Restored. The average age in Indiana of kids being recovered from the sex trafficking industry went from 16 down to 14 in a little over two years. And that takes us then where Indiana now is in this 12 to 14 average uh, age range. So 
as I said, one in three are recruited within 48 hours of leaving home. 80% of these kids that we recover have been involved previously with the Department of Child Services. 50% of them have been involved with the foster care system. And so if you take all those numbers, what we're talking about is 100 to 300,000 US children as victims of commercial sex trafficking each year. And that's according to NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Now I will tell you that number is low. And the reason I know that number is low is because that number is based on the voluntary reports of prostitution charges in the United States for kids under the age of 18. What I can tell you from my own personal experience in dealing with this issue, even on a local basis, but on a statewide basis, talking, working with Tracy, talking with other judges, is that most of these kids are coming into the system, not because of prostitution charges, but they're coming in on other things. So a lot of times on the juvenile delinquency side where they've been acting out in some manner, it might be an auto theft, it might be a battery, it might be something else. Um, or on the chin side of the system, that's the DCS side, where they're found to be a child in need of service. And as we're running our screening tools that we're using now, we're able to identify more of these uh, folks. And so we know that there are a lot more kids out there that we have to be able to identify, and it's not just the 100 to 300,000. So where does it happen? This map of the United States was taken from a website um, that's run by the Polar Polaris Group. And Polaris is an international organization that works to fight human trafficking. Um, so these, uh, this map is based on the number of calls to the hotline. This was a, a few years ago. Oops, sorry. Um, and so you can see that, you know, Indiana's in this kind of big red blob here. Um, but we have more of it on the eastern side of the U.S. than uh, the western side. But obviously, up and down the western coast is big. You know, this I think you're in like the Colorado, Wyoming kind of area. It's kind of hard to read the map. So people ask, you know, why is Indiana in such a a big red blob? And I will tell you, it's a couple reasons. Number one is that we see a huge increase in the number of reports of trafficking when we have large sporting events. And so obviously Indiana is known for several large sporting events, you know, besides having the Super Bowl several, several years ago, I mean, we also have, you know, the 500 and the Brickyard, and then we have a lot of NCAA and basketball kinds of events. And so whenever you have those and you have a lot of people traveling in from out of state, you see the, the increase in numbers. You also will see um, that we are on a pipeline from um, Florida to Chicago but we're also on I-70. And so while transportation is not required, we do see it a lot. And so we'll see Indiana kids being taken elsewhere. We'll, we'll see kids from other states being brought here. We see our own kids being trafficked in Indiana. So happens in a lot of different ways, but that gives you kind of a little bit better idea. The one big caveat and the one thing that was such a surprise to me when I first started doing this work is that victims do not self-identify. And, you know, because I thought in the beginning, mistakenly, that if we recognized a child that was being trafficked um, or we had a kiddo in court, they were going to say, judge, judge, you know, help me, help me because I'm being trafficked. They don't, they don't, they will not tell me because they don't see themselves as a victim. That gets a whole lot into the victimology, which um, I may have left a couple slides in here, but um, in, but I can just tell you that um, these kids see themselves as entrepreneurs. They see themselves as making money. They see themselves as independent. Once they are sucked in, once they are um, you know victimized, if you will, by their perpetrator. Um, there, it's extremely difficult to break that cycle for them and to get them through the services they need. Um, lots of times what we see is these kids are runners. They're, they're going to run and we know they're going to run. And so, um, you know, we've worked to really deal with that within the system, but um, it's extremely difficult to uh, try to address. So here are some of the myths that we deal with um, that children choose to enter the sex trade. That's absolutely not the case. That only girls are trafficked, also false. We deal with boys as well, but we do find the girls more than we find the boys. 
And I've really struggled with this over the last few years. You know, why, why are we not finding boys? Why are we not recovering boys? What I have found and what I learned at one of the national conferences I went to is that for most boys that are involved in trafficking, their first sexual encounter was through online gaming. And the way that that looks or works is that you know, boys play, well, girls do too, but boys play these um, online games and they are chatting while they're playing because they can chat through the features on the gaming system. And so they're chatting with someone they think is another kid their own age. And then that person is like, oh, there's something wrong, you know, with my system, can we text? And so then they exchange phone numbers and then they start texting. And then the person asks them if they'll send a picture of themselves. And so, you know, then obviously the person on the other end is an adult um, who's, you know, trying to lure kids in. They exchange photos, you know, this person sends them a fake photo and then they want, then they start um, complimenting them and telling them, you know, how cute they are, how sexy they are, you know, then they want a nude photo um, or of a body part. And so then the, the boy will send a photo and then they have them. Because then what they do is they start saying, I'm gonna post this, I know where you go to school. Um, because I will tell you, it's extremely easy for people to find out so much about you on the internet and, and through photos because there's um, data associated with the photos that you take and post online. And it takes uh, less than five minutes for them to be able to find photos like through Facebook or whatever. Um, and be able to find out where, where you live, where you go to school. Uh, it's, it's extremely scary. So then they uh, will tell them, they blackmail them. I'm going to share this with everyone in your school. If you don't do what I want, then they want them to participate in like um, recorded sex videos. And then they start selling those. And uh, that kid is too afraid to go to their parents and tell them what happened. They're too embarrassed. They got you know, caught in something. And so um, that's generally how it happens more for boys than for girls. The next myth is that children involved are promiscuous and that they want to have sex. Also not true. Um, that this is not happening in the U.S. Obviously, I mean, we have these conversations because we all know it is happening in the U.S. But when I first started this, um, you know, I still had people asking me if it was really happening in the United States. More often than that, though, I had people saying, is this really happening in Muncie, Indiana? Man, let me tell you, it is happening in Muncie, Indiana. It's happening in our own backyard. Um, it happens in all these different ways that I've talked about today. And the one way then that I could kind of prove to people, if you will, that it was happening in Muncie and that it was such a difficult problem is that at that time, there was a, a website called Backpage.com. Now, Backpage doesn't exist in that form anymore. Um, the people who owned it and operated it were out of California, and they've been um, charged federally. They ended up selling the website. Uh, the feds shut it down. They ended up selling the website, and now it's run um, by some foreign operators. So it's still operating, but it's in a different form than it was. But when Backpage was operating here in the United States, there was so much um, happening in Muncie, Indiana, that Muncie had its own page on Backpage.com. So larger cities, you know, if you if you're searching and you want to you're in the search bar and you're searching for a particular area, you could put in Muncie and Muncie had its own page of advertisements of young, young people, generally young girls um, being sold for sex. Um, another myth that victims could escape if they wanted to, you know, we get into this whole concept of um, Stockholm syndrome. And um, once these kiddos are blackmailed into this by their perpetrator. They don't, they don't see a way out. They don't want a way out. They don't understand that they're being trafficked. A lot of them have never heard the word trafficking. They don't even really know what it is. And they don't understand that's what's happening to them. Tracy and I presented to a group of, um, a youth group at one of our churches in Delaware County. And uh, we told the parents that they could sit in if they wanted to sit in, but they had to sit in the back and they couldn't say anything because we were talking to the kids. And at the end of it, one of the older women um, came up to Tracy and 
said that that's what had happened to her when she was in college. And it was the first time that she'd really realized that that's what had happened to her. And so um, it's just something that, you know, people don't really, they don't understand the concept and kiddos don't get that that's what it is. And then we've already talked about victims not disclosing. We know that they won't. So who's involved? Um, the trafficker, who's the person who compels the labor or services of another, and they're the ones who benefit. They're the money maker. They usually have a recruiter working for them. They gain the victim's trust, and then they sell them or turn them over to the labor, the labor or the pimp. Um, sometimes that person's referred to as a boyfriend. It can be a neighbor. It can be a family member. Then the victim is the person who is either forced or defrauded or coerced if it's an adult, but not if it's a juvenile, um, into providing labor or services. If it's a juvenile, obviously they're under the age of 18. And then the consumer is the person who funds this entire trafficking industry because they're the ones out there purchasing sex with juveniles. And Tracy puts in here, they're often unaware that someone is suffering. I mean, that's probably true. They see this as, you know, no big deal, chip off the old block, I'm just having sex, you know, this person wants to be with me, blah, blah, blah. Um, the consumer drives this, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get into the legislative portion. So here's how pimps or perpetrators, um, traffickers, if you will, control. This is how they recruit. So most of it I'm going to tell you is online. It's either through Facebook or an app called Kick or Snapchat or Instagram. Um, and there are um, advanced, if you will, um, applications of, I think it's Instagram, that you that the kiddos can like pay money for. And they have, you know, it's a more advanced app than the basic one that I would use just to, you know, share my posts. Um, it's a lot of times gang related. It happens in rural areas, just like it does, um, you know, in the larger cities. And so when I present to judges across the state, I mean, one of the biggest things that I've really had to struggle with is there are a lot of judges out there who think that it's not happening in their own county. And especially if they're in a small rural county, they're like, you know, this isn't happening here. And I'm like, you're wrong. I don't care how big or small urban or rural your county is, it's happening in your county. It just may look different than where it's when it's happening in my county. It happens through families. It happens through foster care. It happens at truck stops. Um, there are online dating apps like Plenty of Fish or Scout or Tinder or Sugar Daddy. It happens through those. There's survival sex. So there are a lot of kids out there who may have been trafficked and now are kind of running their own show. And they're trying to survive out there on the streets. A lot of times they're homeless. There's the Romeo kind of recruitment where the perpetrator um, acts as their boyfriend and she thinks of him as her boyfriend. Um, but there are women perpetrators and traffickers too. I don't wanna make this sound like they're all male pimps because they're not. Um, but the Romeo kind of relationship um, is just that. She refers to him as her boyfriend um, and you know he, tries to, you know, charm her. There's the gorilla pimp, which I kind of call the opposite of that. So um, somebody who is scary and mean and loud and will beat the holy crap out of her if she doesn't do what he wants her to do. There are strip clubs where it happens. There's online advertising. There's, it happens through like models and music videos or recruiting. So somebody's out there pretending to be, um, you know, a producer, if you will, and, and trying to suck kids in that way. Um, Tracy talks about track and blade. I don't know a lot about that, but it also happens, you know, just out on the street. So um, I was shocked when I first started learning about all this. There are books out there that teach people how to be a pimp and, um, and you can buy them on Amazon, <laughs> which was quite a surprise to me, but I guess you can buy pretty much everything on Amazon. So this is a direct quote from a book called Pimp Control. Um, I'm sorry, The Pimp Game, an instructional, instructional manual. It was um, uh, printed in 1998. So here's the quote. You'll start to dress her, to think for her, own her. If you and your victim are sexually active, slow it down. After sex, take her shopping for one item. Hair or nails is fine. She'll develop a feeling of accomplishment. The shopping after a month will be replaced with cash. The lovemaking turns to raw sex. 
and she'll start to crave intimacy and be willing to get back into your good graces. After you've broken her spirit, she has no sense of self-value. Now, pimp, put a price tag on the item you've manufactured. And that's exactly how they do it. I mean, that's the mentality behind it. It's the philosophy behind it. And that's how they teach other people to be pimps. So some of the victimology that we see and look at, um, these are some of the risk factors. So there's a history of childhood abuse or family conflict or violence. They have prior involvement in the child welfare system. Remember, I told you that 80% of these kids have been involved with DCS previously. A lot of poverty, but I don't want you to think it's all poverty because it's not. We see a lot of kids who are from upper middle class, upper class families. There's homelessness, a need to be loved. Um, they feel misunderstood. Or their parents don't care. How many kids do you know that that applies to? I mean, I remember feeling that way when I was growing up, right? Um, and and my parents did care, but all kids at some point feel that way. They want independence. They'll test boundaries and take risks, and they're attracted to consumer goods. I mean, when I go through this list, this is like every kid I know. And so these kids are at high risk for this. Some of the health indicators that we see, they've had neglected health care needs. There are signs of physical abuse like bruises, black eyes, burns, cuts, broken teeth, multiple scars. They're malnourished. I will tell you that when we recover kiddos and, just, and determine that they are a victim of trafficking, the first two things that we have them do when they're brought in, number one is eat, and then number two is sleep. We deal with the health care needs after they've eaten and after they have slept. Um, they usually have poor dental hygiene and evidence of trauma. They have frequent or multiple STDs or pregnancies. Here's one of the big ones, branding and then tattoos and tracking chips. So traffickers will brand their kids. They will um, usually tattoo them. Usually the tattoo is gonna be on their neck, under their ear, um, might be other places on their body, but that's gonna be a big place or across their chest. And it's usually going to say either daddy or it's going to have a male name under, you know, tattooed there. When, um, well, I'll, give me a second, I'll finish this part of it and then I'll tell you a story. So sometimes it's going to be a dollar sign. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, other things, but that's going to be the big one. And then tracking chips, we have not yet seen in Indiana that anyone has identified, but I want to show you some pictures. These were provided to us by Riley Hospital and they got them from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so you can see where the chips are um, put in there and it's like chipping your animal. So if you have a pet and you've got them chipped, that's exactly what this is. And so that's how they're able to um, keep track of the kiddo um, by having that tracking chip in them. So they're not gonna lose them. So the story I referenced just a second ago, I had a uh, I've had several women in my court, adults, who have had tattoos under their ear, you know, on their neck. And so I'm sitting on the bench and I can see this tattoo. And I'll tell you what's super frustrating to me is that no one else has seen this or paid any attention to it. Not their defense attorney, not the prosecutor, not a probation officer, although probation is getting much better at it. I've trained them several times. And so they call me now when they see things like that. But, but otherwise, you know, I'm, the, I'm sitting up there on the bench and I see it and I'm thinking, how am I supposed to deal with this? Because usually, and I will tell you that every time I've noticed something like this, their trafficker is in the courtroom um, because the trafficker wants her out. He wants to postpone. He wants her out on electronic house arrest. He wants her where he can have her back working again. So I have to be really careful because if the trafficker knows that I know, then I'm afraid she's going to get the crap beat out of her when she gets home. So I try to be very mindful of that. So um, I have um, a couple, you know, a couple times like I've seen the tattoo and I'll, I'll um, maybe call the attorneys up to the bench and say, you know, I see a tattoo on your client's neck. But one day I had this woman in and I'll tell you that there's more, there's, it's a longer story. So since Shelby's not here to share, I'm just gonna tell you the longer story because we have a little bit of time. 
So um, I had been out to dinner with Tracy the night before this happened. She was in town. And so we went to Olive Garden. And we got there like around six o'clock. And you know how Olive Garden is at six o'clock before COVID. Um, there's a line and you're having to sit there, wait. And so we're sitting in the lobby area, just chit-chatting and waiting. And sitting across from us um, was uh, um, young man. I mean, probably, I don't know, 30s. And he has a woman sitting with him and she's, you know, got her arms all, you know, interlocked with his and draped all over him and they're chatting. Um, the young man was black. And uh, the reason I say that is because his hair was done in an uh, unusual way. And so it's not something I would forget. I noticed it. So um, the next day, I, well, I'm sorry. And so while we're sitting there, Tracy kind of, you know, nods that way and says, that's, he's her trafficker. She goes, I can just tell, you know, and she's been doing this work a long time and she's a mental health professional and, and I believed her, but you know, at that point I'm like, oh, interesting. Okay. But there wasn't anything we could do about it. So I go into court the next morning and I mean, I scan the audience area, if you will, kind of the gallery behind tables. I, but I really just do that to make sure that nothing hinky is going on and that we're all safe. But I didn't really pay attention to faces or hair. And so um, one of my, if you will, regular, she's, she's in, uh, I don't know, I mean, I've seen her a few times, um, is sitting at council table with her attorney and she's been picked up on a probation violation. She wants to get out of jail while her uh, case is pending. And her attorney is asking me to let, out, let her out on either electronic house arrest or um, just, you know, on her own recognizance. And she says, she's, she, has, she, she has what I call diarrhea of the mouth. She just starts talking and she doesn't shut up. And so she's talking and she's telling me that her daughter's there in the courtroom and her daughter's pregnant. She wants to get out so that she can be there when her grandchild is born. And she kind of, you know, head nods towards her daughter. And I look up and her daughter is sitting with the guy that was in Olive Garden last night. And her daughter is not the woman who was sitting with the guy in Olive Garden last night. And her daughter is pregnant and she's looking all friendly with the, that guy. And I'm like, oh my God, Tracy was right. Number one. And number two, he's their trafficker. So he's trafficking pregnant girl. He's trafficking mom. And I'm thinking, what on earth am I going to do with this? And so mom had a tattoo on her neck, the, the defendant, under her ear. And so remember I said she had diarrhea of the mouth and she was talking. So while she's talking, normally I'd probably shut her up, but she's talking and I'm trying to figure out what, what the tattoo says. And so I'm looking and I'm straining and, you know, I mean, you guys have probably either seen pictures of the courtroom or been in our courtrooms to observe. Um, it, there's some distance between the bench and council table. So it was not an easy feat for me to figure out what that tattoo said. But I finally figured it out and it said P-I-M-P, -P, pimp. That was the tattoo. And so now I'm intrigued. Now it's like, okay. So I say to her, finally, after she's, you know, yammering for a, quite a while, I said, ma'am, that's an interesting tattoo on your neck. What does that say? And without missing a beat, she said, power in my prayer. That stands for power in my prayer, P-I-M-P, -P, power in my prayer. It stands for power in my prayer. And she just kind of kept going like that. And I'm, and I'm chuckling to myself. I'm like, wow, that's her story. And she's sticking to it. I said, ma'am, it doesn't say power in my prayer. It says P-I-M-P. -P. And she goes, right, power in my prayer. That's what it stands for. And I'm like, okay. So we went on with the case, but that's not the only case that that's happened with for me as an, you know, with adults. And, and again, like juveniles, those adults are in my courtroom on other stuff, not prostitution charges, you know, for other things. But I'm able in knowing these red flags to be able to um, pick some of them out anyway. So here are some of the red flags that we're looking for. Um, they may have false identification on them. They have the branding or tattoos. So the names, numbers, dollar signs. Um, sometimes they're on their chest, fingers, or lower back, in addition to being under their ear or on um, their chest. There's inappropriate clothing for the occasion or time of year. They appear to be malnutrition, malnourished, sorry. 
Um, they may be a frequent, frequent runaway past or current homelessness. There may be gang affiliation. There may be current or prior suspected prostitution. That youth might be unfamiliar with the area. They're submissive or fearful. They don't speak for themselves. You know, somebody else is speaking for them. Um, some of the other red flags, they acknowledge exchanging sex for money or goods. So again, they don't know or see that as trafficking, but they, they might acknowledge exchanging sex for money or goods, and they don't get that that's trafficking. They might be advertised on something like Skip the Games. We used to say that was back page, so now the big website is Skip the Games. There may be an adult other than their parents speaking for them and is controlling. There may be an older male in their company, um, but not related, and they identify as a boyfriend. Um, someone other than the youth has control of their identification. They may have been recovered at a hotel. There's a prolonged period of absence from home without explanation. They're a runaway, could be from foster care. Um, so some of the challenges that we face from the foster care system, this is how a kid is conditioned for trafficking if they're in foster care. The money is provided to the caregiver in foster care and they're used to being that paycheck. It's for the foster parent's personal use and it equates to earning for the exploiter. They're used to being placed in numerous places. They don't learn to reconcile after an argument. If a kiddo has an argument in foster care and it's a blow up, the foster parent's calling DCS DCS is moving that child. So that's not a healthy way, you know, to deal with these kinds of situations. And these kids who are in foster care um, have been through such trauma. And so, you know, they're, I mean, they're also in counseling when they're in foster care, but um, it seems to me that we need to do a better job of teaching reconciliation after arguments than just moving them. So they don't establish relationships and they're accustomed to being isolated. All of those things condition a child for being trafficked. So here's the big challenge. And I, I took out a bunch because I thought Shelby was gonna be talking today, but the biggest challenge that we face in legislation today has to do with the purchasing. Remember I told you that purchasing drives trafficking. If we didn't have so many people purchasing sex with juveniles, in our own community, in our state, in our country, this would not be the problem that it is because the only way that traffickers make money is selling those kids to people wanting to have sex with juveniles, right? If you think about that. And so in Indiana, a trafficker faces that maximum three to 16 years if they're trafficking a juvenile, but a purchaser faces only one to six years because it's a level five felony. And so in Indiana, um, if somebody's purchasing sex, they get charged with a level five. As a judge, I can pretty much tell you that a prosecutor is going to plead that down to a level six. And the person's going to plead to a level six. And on a level six, they could get jail time, but most often they get probation. They get a suspended sentence and they're put on probation. And so how many people are going to be discouraged from buying sex with a juvenile if they know that they're just gonna get probation time. They're not. For the last three to four years, I have been working with a group of legislators trying to get this change. Sue Arrington has been wonderful, Melanie Wright, wonderful, Tim Lannon, wonderful, trying to help me get this changed. And for the last several years, I haven't even been able to get a hearing in committee on this. As hard as those guys have fought for me, to try to get this dealt with. Last year, um, I worked with a group of legislators. So besides those three, we pulled in some people from Anderson and Indianapolis. And um, even there was, we had one legislator that was from Southern Indiana trying to help us address this issue. And, um, and, and again, I couldn't even get a hearing. I mean, it was a short session. So that really limits the number of bills that get heard. Um, but the guy who chairs the committee that we were trying to go through, he was on the Senate side. Um, I kind of tackled him. Um, hang on one second. I approached him at a um, reception that I was at and um, introduced myself and explained 
you know, what was going on and that he had the bill and that I needed a hearing and committee on it. And he shut me down. I mean, he was nice, but he shut me down and he's like, I can only hear so many bills. And there are just several other things that are more important this session. And I'm like, how can you say that buying sex with kids in Indiana, who's your kids is not more important than something else. And, and he was like, well, they're just, they're not going to be put in jail. And I'm like, that's what I'm trying to do here. You know, what we're, what we're trying to do is add what's called a juvenile enhancement so that, you know, that it's a level five felony, but if you're purchasing sex with a juvenile, it would be raised to a level four so that they wouldn't get pled down to a six. We wouldn't just be looking at probation. We would be taking this more seriously. And he just, I could not get him off dead center, never got a hearing on it last year. So went back to the same group of legislators this summer because that I got that group together and we've met the last two summers. So we met again this summer on Zoom. And so we decided that um, maybe the way to go would be for me to reach out to the Chief Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court. And she's very supportive. Um, and I emailed her and I explained the situation. She knew last year that I was working on it. And I explained to her what was going to happen this year if we couldn't get some help. And basically what was going to happen is that the same legislator who submitted the bill last time, which is Mike Crayer, and he's from the Indy area, um, that if he had to submit it this year, it would get referred to a summer study committee. And that's all that would happen. We wouldn't be to the summer study committee until next summer. And so we would be a year further down the road. So the chief justice emailed me back and she set up a meeting with me and representative um, McNamara, um, who's also from the Indy area. And she chairs the same committee, but on the house side. And so, um, so we did a Zoom phone call, the three of us, and she agreed to put me in her summer study committee this summer. So we made it out of summer study committee, which helps us. It goes a long way toward then a vote um, on the Senate side because um, Senator Kreider is going to reauthor the bill and resubmit it. So um, hopefully this year we'll be able to get our juvenile enhancement on that statute. Sorry, that was kind of a long story, but so that you understand what's going on, that's that's what's going on. And that's our current issue. That's our current fight. Um, so we'll see what happens. Some of the other things that we're working on that committee that um, you read in my bio that I chair is the um, uh, subcommittee through the Commission on Children. So commercial sexual exploitation of children is what CSEC stands for. And so that's our committee name. We have developed a juvenile probation screener. We're in the process of tweaking that right now. Um, we have developed quick indicator tools. Um, we've developed them for the education. Uh, so teachers, they have their own tool and that's on their state website. We've also developed one for the healthcare industry because while I told you that 80% of these kids have been involved in the um, welfare side of the system and 50% in foster care, 90% of kids see a healthcare professional while they are being trafficked. So we knew that we need to get to the healthcare industry and, and train doctors and nurses on this. So I did a training for Ball Hospital several years ago. I did a training for the Open Door Clinic a couple years ago. And we've also tra trained EMS through some of the trainings they have. And then we have uh, quick indicator tools also for law enforcement. We have trained law enforcement here locally. Um, honestly, it probably needs to happen every couple of years. There's also training on the law enforcement on their state website. We have pilot counties that are piloting that juvenile probation screener. We're now up to 11 counties. And our goal is to roll that out to the entire state um, by 2022. So there's some numbers that you can contact if you believe someone is a victim of human trafficking. And I'm gonna stop my share and I'll open it up for questions. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and let me know what your question is. Kim, would you uh, share those numbers 
for contacting uh, so that we all have them available. Yep. Let me just, I'll go ahead and share it again. And Maybe you could put it in and we could put it in our newsletter. Um, yep. So let's do this. I'm going to do this and I'm going to put it in my chat. Okay. And All right. So um, I'll type that. If you have a question, you can go ahead. What committees um, out of the legislature in the House and then in the Senate are going to would hear this first? Um, well, the the committee has I, we got through the summer study committee, so I don't have to go through another committee now. I don't think. Um, but the bill would have to won't the bill have to be heard in committee? Well. That's probably a good point. Um, I'm guessing it would be uh, courts and criminal code then. Okay. And and so starting on the Senate side again, and that's the last the person last year who um, was uh, not nice to me. Um, but now that we've made it through summer study committee, I think that um, gives us the end that we need. Okay. Uh, and so we need to look for a bill number. And the reason I'm asking that is that it, the league can help to track uh, what's happening with the legislation and get people to write to their legislators for support. Right, yeah, and, and I don't have that yet. Um, I won't know it probably until December, I think. Okay, when you know, would you mind emailing me? I, I will, yeah, I will. That would be uh, great and we'll yep. get it out. Okay, and I so I put in my chat box those numbers. Thank you. Yep, you bet. Other questions? Yeah, well, this is a comment. This is Julie Mason. How is everybody doing? Julie, how are you? Fine, thank you. Um, my experience um, with tra um, sex trafficking, it has to do when I lived in Reno, Nevada. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't live, you know, I lived in California and also when I was in Europe. Bottom line, I want this is just my comment. I think a lot of times the reason why we, it's difficult to get legislation or any kind of change uh, in laws is because people in higher places are the ones who participate in those activities. Oh, absolutely. That's absolutely true. So, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that kids don't want to trust the law enforcement officer, the judge, their probation officer is because it's been judges, lawyers, prosecutors, um, legislators firemen, policemen who have purchased sex from them. Exactly. So yeah, they have no reason to trust me or, you know, trust anybody in the system. Um, so yeah, thank you, Julie. That's a very good point. Yes. And one thing I, you had mentioned, like sporting events, people, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent media for people to come in for prostitution. Really, it's anything with a large group of people. It could be going to a conference on I'm going to make this up, but it, it, it sounds bad for all uh, uh, um, ministers of a certain church yeah, group. Absolutely. These, 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 the, the groups are, I forget what you, what you label them as, those professionals, it is truly a profession. Like you and I have a job we go to. Yep. It is truly a profession. They study the art form of it. I mean, I wouldn't say it's an art form, but they study, they study like it's a science and they are, yep. they, they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Um, there was an incident when I lived in um, in Europe, especially in Belgium, uh, for the longest. This was back in the, I would say, so this was back in the late 90s. You would see these signs across the highways, you know, advertising. But this this is what dealing with little children, though. These were, you know, sex offenders with little children. These little children, like, you know, elementary school students were, were missing. And then, I mean, they were everywhere, always on the highways. We got to find out what's happening to these kids. They're being kidnapped. And then when we found out what was going on, we found out who was who was in this service. I mean, who was who were the users of this service? They were primarily, don't get me wrong, were lawmakers. Absolutely. And lawmakers. you know, when yeah. I mean we like, mm -hmm. why do you, you know it's like there's a part of me that's super frustrated about not being able to get hearings in these committees yeah. and stuff. I mean 
you know, yes, I'm jaded. Yes, I am. You know, I look at the negative side of this sometimes, but you know, it, it does not get past me that, you know, there's a component of that to this. Yes. Yes. And also something I wanted to mention to you too, um, um, I, when, because I did go to Reno a lot, they had a lot of, uh, you know, because of the casino, but also they had a lot of what I call community events. The community events could be, oh, um, uh, street vibration. So there would have to be thousands of people that would come in on motorcycles, you know, to this event. Or it could be any, really when it comes down to anything that's going to draw people from other communities yeah. to come in, that's when all this sex yeah. trafficking, prostitution, drugs, happens so it's not just at negative events or sporting events mm -mm. it's anything that draws people that that the i forget what you call the people um that that, that control the whole group where they could where it's going to be a large drawing of people yeah yeah so i mean conferences conventions any of those kinds of things where you're drawing large crowds it's going to happen you know, and, and one of the other statistics that I, it's not my PowerPoint, but that I've learned when I talked about, you know, boys being trafficked too, 35%-ish of the people who are purchasing sex with boys are women. So this isn't just a male thing. This is a female thing too. Oh my yes. gosh. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's just so much out there that, um, that I've learned, honestly. Yes. Uh, one thing I want to mention too, when I was in Reno and I was talking about this, the street vibration. So bottom line, people come from all over with motorcycles and literally the sex, the, um, the advocates for sex trafficking went to all the various churches during that time to let them know that this is going on. It's going to be lots of people. So please help, help us. If you see anything that doesn't seem, um, um, correct. Because yeah. what was happening during this time period, the churches would open up their churches for people to come and eat and fellowship. And of course, you know, they could see these things going on there too, because those people sure. would bring those children to, or, yeah. or adults to those events too. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you for letting me sharing that experience because. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Julie, for sharing. Yeah. There's things that underneath our notes, like you said about the tattoo, we don't think anything about it, but it's there are evidence we just don't we just aren't aware of them to see that it does exist and we yep. need to be more aware so that we can help because yeah. we don't know absolutely i'd like to comment that in our current current political climate right now uh there's a whole group of people that believe there's a conspiracy for child trafficking right now and I see a lot of posts on Facebook where people are warning the children are being literally plucked out of backyards and things like that. And I think the danger in buying into that is that people are totally blind to the really vulnerable population of children in our midst. Um, a lot of us don't have contact with foster children or Sure. Um, I, I'm a nurse and I worked in uh, mental health for a while. We had a in-house adolescent unit. Mm -hmm. These kids are in and out all the time uh, yeah. for <clears throat> suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. And when they're back out, they don't have anybody to protect them. Nobody. No, no they don't. There, uh, there's, I mean, you know, there's so much about our system that's good, but there's so much about our system that's broken. I mean, we need so much more in terms of mental health um, services for kids, especially, I mean, for adults too, but we just have, you know, so little for kids these days. And there's just, um, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to make a, a little side comment that's not really so much specifically about trafficking, but is about our welfare side of the system right now. We've gone to this, you know, families first philosophy and Department of Child Services is, you know, kind of under this um, directive, if you will, where, you know, they're supposed to try and keep kids with families first. And in theory, that sounds good, but there's a reason kiddos are being taken from their homes, you know, I mean, I don't like separating kids from their families, but, but it's necessary in a lot of cases. And so now instead, they're just sending them right back in. And 
you know, with trafficking, that's one of my biggest concerns is that they're trying to get them right back in. Well, if it's their parents who are trafficking them, you're putting them right back in that situation and they are not going to tell you or me that that's what's happening. So there's just, there's so much that we really, really, really have to be vigilant about because the system itself is not being vigilant. I agree with you. And hi, this is this is Stacy Ingram. I could you expand on that a little bit? Um, yeah. I'm kind of interested in what happens to the people who are trafficked. You mentioned that one of the things that happens to them is that uh, some of them end up homeless after this. And yeah. I think that getting them away from the traffickers is only half oh, of, of the story. And <laughs> I don't know what happens to the other half of, of the- Yeah, I mean, we could talk about this all day, literally. Um, you know, I, sure. I really, I have to guard myself when I start talking because um, I could go on for hours. So um, because it happens in so many different ways, um, we're trying to, you know, provide services to kids um, in, as a result of all those different ways. One of the things that I really fought hard to do and was able to accomplish was I worked with the Youth Opportunity Center to open a separate facility. And, and so it's called True Harbor and they have a separate campus from the YOC, it's in Henry County. Um, and it's just for girls and just girls who are victims of human trafficking to provide them with services specific to trafficking. It is the only facility like it in Indiana. There are some other facilities like it in other states. Um, and so it's been open now for a couple of years, um, but we're already seeing some redu reduction in the number of kiddos who are being placed there from DCS because of this family's first um, directive, if you will. Um, hang on one second. Okay, so Families First, um, as I said, really tries to keep kids with families. And so, you know, as judges across the state, I mean, we, we just have to, we're asking a lot more questions and um, there's a process that we have to go through if we want to um, challenge DCS on, you know, leaving that kiddo in the home that they're in. Um, but there are a lot of kids who are trafficked that, you know, they're trafficked from the age of 11, 12 years old, and we don't see them or find them or recover them in the system sometimes until they're 15, 16 years old. So if that happens, then, um, they are so ingrained in it that trying to convince them that they're a victim is next to impossible. Once they reach the age of 18, I can't force them into services anymore. And so I still utilize services of people like Tracy to interview those young women when we find them. And, you know, like I have them as an adult in my court and I can call her and say, look, I've got a 22 year old who I, I, I know is being trafficked and, you know, Tracy will arrange an interview with them and will offer them services, will offer them a way out, but I've not yet had one who's taken those services. Um, and even when she's had adults who have taken services, usually they've run, you know, and left whatever those services are pretty quickly. Um, so I think that, um, Services to, in my opinion, are key and services as juveniles is the key. I, we've got to get them as juveniles and we have to get them those services before they turn 18. That's, that's our only hope. Um, but beyond that, that's, you know, that's probably about as much as I can say. And I don't know, Stacy, if you have any other questions that are more specific than that. No, that, that was exactly what I wanted to know. It's, um, Basically, we need to do more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. What, as members of the community, what can we do other well, than pressure our lawmakers? Yeah. I mean, so the, you know, this particular bill that, that we're going to be talking about this year is the one thing. Um, 
you know, beyond that, I, I tell people, you know, if you want me to, um, hang on one second, if you want me to speak to other groups, if you're involved in other groups and you want me to speak to them, I am happy to speak to groups. Um, if there are other healthcare agencies that you are a part of or are familiar with and you want me to speak to them, I mean, I, I think getting to healthcare professionals right now is uh, between them and law enforcement. Those are our two biggest groups that we just need to train, 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 keep training, train again, um, because they're the ones who come into contact with these kiddos the most and, you know, first before anybody else. I, I will train until I don't have a voice anymore. I will train until the day I retire because, um, sorry, that's, we have someone at the door and that's my dog alerting us. Um, to me, that's primary. And, um, you know, people ask me why I like being a judge. Um, to be completely honest with you, if I were still practicing law, I would never have really known so much about this issue. I would not have had the time to um, put on this issue that I have had as a judge, and I wouldn't have had the contacts that I have. Um, you know, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court wouldn't have paid attention to me as a practicing attorney so much. I mean, I don't mean to, I'm not dissing her, but I'm, I'm just saying I wouldn't have had that contact for her then to say, one of my trial court judges is working on this, you know, can you help? Um, so just being able, you know, to do this work um, is one of the reasons that I really enjoy what I do. And, and I don't mean to say that it's a fun thing to do, but I feel like I can make a difference. And so, you know, that's what I, why I do what I do. I think and you do make a difference too. Thank you so much for what you do. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask one other question. Um, sure. Two years ago, I heard uh, Loretta Rush, our Supreme Court Justice, uh -huh. um, who talked about the family court system that was being established across Indiana. And the family first guidelines for DCS, how do those play into this family court system where everybody's supposed to be um, considered in the judgments that you're making? Um, that's a really good question. Um, was she, so when you heard her speak, was she talking about the, like the juvenile courts and the welfare side? Is that what she was, was that what you heard? She was calling it family court that she wanted to have established in every, in okay. every county. And as far as I could figure out, we didn't have one in Muncie. It, no. it is in other places in Indiana, but. Well, so one of the things that we've done in Delaware County, and one of the other things that, that I've worked on and gotten accomplished is something called family recovery court. And so that's um, going to be somewhat similar to what you're talking about. And so we do have that in Delaware County now. We've had that for a little over a year, about a year and a half. And so, um, but that's different, a little bit different than the families first. Now they, they can go together. Um, so family, fa yeah. So family recovery court is, um, thank you. So family recovery court is um, part of our juvenile system. It's part of the welfare side of the system. So DCS, CHINS cases. And so if we have a family where their children um, are being removed or um, if the family just has substance abuse challenges and maybe they're not removing the kids, they can be placed into family recovery court and they do that voluntarily. So we offer that to them and, and they can accept or reject. If they accept, then their case in family recovery court runs parallel to their case in the Chins court. And, um, and so they would meet weekly in the beginning. Um, and then that, you know, becomes biweekly and then monthly. We had our first graduation class just about a month ago um, of our first five um, participants who graduated out. And so that is to provide um, wraparound services to the entire family. It's not just to the parents, so the kids get help too. And so they're in counseling and they're going to um, different um, services that we can provide to them that teach them about 
you know, kind of what their parents have gone through and what they can do to support themselves and, you know, counselors supporting them and so forth. And so, so that's kind of a version of that family court concept, I think that the chief had, but um, beyond that, I, I don't know what other uh, models she's looking at. I guess part of what I was concerned about was how um, child, Department of Child Services, DCS, uh -huh. um, intersects with the court um, processes because if they've got family first as their guideline and that's not necessarily helping the kids who might be trafficked, somewhere that, has, that support has to come for the whole family and get you know, yeah, and, and DCS can provide services to them, you know, they're keeping the kids in the home, but they can still provide services and those are still paid for out of the DCS budget and so forth. But um, my fear and concern is that we're not uh, keeping eyes enough on those kids in those situations. Good morning, Judge. Thank you for your Hi. presentation. Yep, you're uh, welcome. I was just curious, why do the purchasers not get charged with statutory rape? Um, I mean, there are, they could get charged with child molesting. They mm -hmm. could get charged with rape, but then the kiddo has to allege that they were raped and that kiddo is never going to get, never going to allege that. Mm -hmm. It's, and, you know, and so this presents a real difficult problem for law enforcement too. Um, law enforcement has a really hard time investigating these trafficking cases both from the trafficker perspective and from the purchaser perspective, because the victim has to cooperate and provide mm -hmm. them with information. And, and because right. they're not right. self-disclosing, they're not providing that information. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just, it's, it's super complicated. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. Any other questions? I think we're just going to see more issues too because um, the state budget is going to be cut even further because oh, yeah. of COVID. Yep. So there's going to be even less uh, money in DCS to follow through. And if the kids are in a bad situation and they get put back in the home, they're just going to run away again. There's, there's no good alternatives. No, it's, I mean, it, this issue is very complex is very challenging. And um, those of us who work to fight it are just um, stubborn and diligent. And, you know, we just keep, yeah, we just keep doing the work, you know, because the kids are worth it. And so we're just uh, doing the best that we can. And, you know, one problem at a time, kind of baby steps, if you will, we've, you know, we've managed to get a few different um, bills passed. And so, um, you know, one of those, one of the, probably one of the biggest things that we got passed was that we decriminalized prostitution for juveniles in Indiana. We became a safe harbor state. And that was work that I did with Tim Lannon to get that done. And to be completely honest, I really think, I mean, Tim is great at what he does. Um, I, you know, I was able to see it firsthand. Um, and I, that was my first real experience of kind of watching a bill from the very beginning and the process that our, our representatives have to go through. Um, and I watched him maneuver and, uh, you know, negotiate and move things around. And it was very fascinating. Um, and, but he managed to get that passed. And I think it kind of got past a lot of people that it was being passed. And it was, it's still a little bit controversial um, that we managed to get that done, but you know, I'm like, hello, why are we charging kids with prostitution? You are just further criminalizing them when they're a victim and we shouldn't be doing that. So, um, so that was the big first accomplishment that I would say that I had. And then, so now we're working on that purchasing part of it. Great. Thank you so much. Yep. You're absolutely welcome. Yeah, it's been informative and uh, because this is an issue for the league, we will look forward to learning the bill about the bill and follow it okay. and see what Good. kind of pressure we can also put on our legislators. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge Don. All right. Yep. I'll go ahead and thank leave you. and you guys have a good day. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. 
So I would like to uh, ask, actually, Judy, would you like to say anything about the plans we're trying to make for the holiday brunch? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Judy Capone, and I've contacted three of our uh, state house representatives and asked them to come on uh, December 19th to speak to us. I haven't gotten a response yet, but I will keep keep in uh, keep after it, and I'll get the message out to everybody in plenty of time to plan. Um, January's meeting is with the AAUW. Uh, they plan the, the agenda for that meeting. But I just wanted to tell you, I do have Angela Adams, the immigration attorney, that uh, we had to have a last minute cancellation last month. The day before she was going to speak, she had a terrible fall and suffered a complicated leg fracture. So she's agreed to try again in February. So we've got her booked for February 20th. Um, that's it for me. I will keep everybody posted on the newsletter and send out blurbs uh, when we get that finalized. Thank you, Judy. So we have, um, we have our program scheduled. We have more information coming out in our newsletter in the next day or so. Um, and I would suggest that you all look at our new website. There's a lot of information there. The calendar will be up there. Uh, our website is still lwvmunciedelaware.org. One of the things that I want you to look at in the newsletter in particular, um, there we are have formed a social justice committee. It's new. Its second meeting will be November 24th. You can read about that. And then, um, on December 1st, which is Giving Tuesday, and you can consider the league. <laughs> there is also a meeting of the uh, Muncie City Council Land and Traffic Committee, and they are hearing the Tui Park proposal. Uh, and there is opportunity for people to speak. It will also be um, live streamed on the City Council website. So if you, think about our green space and the position that the league has taken in the past having to do with green space and parks and where we stand as a community. Um, we are below the uh, even the average suggested for green space per resident. Um, and in the vision 2021 that map that the community put together uh, with lots of feedback. The two, first two goals, if you recall, because I've mentioned these before, some of you know, um, are quality of life and quality of place. And our parks are a crucial piece of that. And they're mentioned in the Vision 2021 uh, statement. So if you can be there December 1st, that is also coming out in the newsletter with all the details. Um, if you can't be there in person, because there will be a limited number of people who can get in, you may watch it um, live and they will be taking questions um, on Zoom. So you'll be able to see what's there and be able to ask some questions. Uh, again, holiday brunch, December 19th, that is with AAUW and then our second joint meeting as Judy mentioned will be in January with them. So we sort of trade that off. We won't be doing brunch in person, it will be virtual. So we'll try to remind you all to have coffee and um, <laughs> coffee cake or something else with you when you do some fruit. Um, so at this point, I would like to thank you all for coming, for being here for this program and we will keep you up to date on how to follow through to support this bill on ju the juvenile enhancement bill. Okay, thank you so much.